an extension of the economic structure. It pretty much has to be. And the economic structure, again, has nothing to do with nature or resources or anything. It's about blind cyclical consumption and a lot of things that we're going to talk about with uh, Dr. John McMurtry when he calls in here in a moment. But um, to give an overview of John McMurtry, as, as many might have known, excuse me, many might have seen the social pathology lecture I did in the Zeitgeist Day 2010, roughly 25% of that was taken from his book, The Cancer Stage of Capitalism, and I source it there. And it's a very, uh, it's a very important work. Um, John has written about 16 literary works, if I remember correctly. He is the moral philosopher at the University of Guelph in Canada, and uh, I think his most defining work is probably The Cancer Stage of Capitalism. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. I think it's one of the oldest associations of scientists and scholars, a very objective association. And uh, he was featured in Zeitgeist Moving Forward, very much highlighted, and uh, just a really tremendous mind. And if anyone's ever read his works, uh, he has a very deep grasp of language and communication. And he really cuts to the bone of what really the problem is and and is very much beyond the pale, if you will, and absorbs a great deal of heat, just like many of us do, and his courage, though, to move forward in the way he has with his writings and his activism uh, is truly, truly phenomenal. So I'm going to be patching him in in one second here. Hold on one moment. John, are you with us? Yes, I am, Peter. Hey, it's great to speak with you again. How are you? You as well. Yeah, fine. Excellent, excellent. Well, I'm finally got a little technical glitches out of the way, and I'm really yes, pleased to have you. you here. And I was just given a general introduction of yourself and your works, and um, and everything that you've done, and your activism, and of course your courage. I, that's something that you probably don't get very often. But as we'll discuss in uh, the questions that we prepared, uh, this system tends to want to. <laughs> want to counteract anybody that, um, you know, that anyone attempts to challenge any attribute of it, and it manifests itself in many different ways. So I want to applaud you for, for your, your courage to stand strong in a, in a world where pretty much everything is against us that are trying to seek a more sustainable approach to society. So thank you, yes, John. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And indeed, you're right. They're, the selective pressures against uh, really any principle that you stand for that – conflicts with the uh in our time uh the ultimately regulating private money sequences becoming more money <laughs> any place that you stand against that even if you st uh, stand against uh, certain of the which you yourself have perceived in the case of Descartes iconic figures inside the history of human thought and philosophy it's really quite remarkable even within the academy is, itself the selective pressures against it yeah, exactly. Now, you made a great point in your your great work, The Cancer Stage of Capitalism, about Socrates and the slavery that existed, and this was considered normality during yeah. that time. So, uh, And it makes us all wonder all the things that we take for granted in the current time that we'll look back in the future and say, wow, <laughs> what were we thinking, you know? I often have that. I've had that vision for many, many years of just what would – if you were to drop in from a hundred years hence, and indeed I try to write from that perspective of what will it seem like reading this a hundred years hence and try to be into that meaning space to understand because one is so conditioned, so pervasively conditioned by the assistance to acceptance of it and validation of it that um, – Really, it does. That is that is a thought that is indeed with me all the time. Is how inconceivable will it be to any future if there is a future that that it could be so systematically life blind at every level, so that the very ultimate and universal life support systems that we depend upon, from the hydrological cycles to biodiversity to the quality of food and so forth that it just doesn't matter it doesn't compute to this uh, to this framework of understanding that has been so instituted and virtually anything that has stood in its way or conflicted with it at the social level for example a society with an alternative system has been attacked and indeed one might say genocided culturally and often physically for uh, for standing for or representing any uh, alternative structure to it. That's something that's been going on since biblical times, 
and certainly has been going on with the latest God, which is, you know, it's a theo-capitalist system. And um, so we we really do wonder, what, you know, at what point will there be the great awakening to actually what a uh, completely systematically life-destructive this system is that is presupposed a priori. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I guess uh, I think the community that we work with, we just hope that it doesn't have to get too bad before the majority of people on this planet <laughs> do awaken, you know, where we don't pass the point of no return, as as they say. Well, this is, yeah, this is really the problem, uh, is yeah. that one wonders, I think a lot of people secretly, this of course doesn't go on in the uh, the corporate media as to this, you know, the situation that we're now in, and, and people have been intuiting increasingly that that it had, you know, possibly it has become cumulatively irreversible. Um, and each turning point that we come to, and we came to a great turning point in 2008, a wonderful turning point at one level in terms of how bad things can get before they get better. The whole financial system, which is behind our our problem most of all, it's the ultimate causal determinant of it, that when the whole financial system collapses at the center with Wall Street and that, you know, it was around people's homes. <clears throat> and you just thought, this is the time that the reforms that have been needed for so long can come in. You take away Wall Street's ability to print all the money uh, through debt, uh, you know, having uh, basically uh, debt creation of money, right. and you uh, you have... You have homes now, since Wall Street and since their, you know all these derivative financial functions can no longer manage it for their private profit, then we are now going to lend money to people's homes. You've lost it. You can't do the job. You've blown the shop. You've shown yourself incompetent at the level that you think is most important. That is a market economy. You've failed completely. Now we easily pass, and it, it really could have happened. Just said, well, we're taking over the loan of, uh, you know, f- home loans uh, for people, and uh, we're going to do it in the way it used to be done. Uh, we're going to be doing it by the, the need of people and their ability to pay back over time, and we're not going to charge compounding interest. And it's just going to return to the public domain. Is so much of what you know has gone wrong is because it's been. Uh, taken out of the public domain, and you know this was especially post-war and so forth that it moved into the public domain, and we we resolved the housing uh, problem, we resolved the uh, we resolved the you know the um, compounding money debt through these instruments that they have that nobody can understand that uh, completely uh, it, you know completely. Uh, uh, hollows them out uh, as people and financially to carry the debt load, which they can't, and they thought this was securitization, that this was a way of guaranteeing their loans. Mm-hmm. And then at the same time, we can resolve this financial problem and the house housing problem, speaking very ad hoc, very specifically, addressing directly the problems, addressing directly the failures, and we move on from there. But of course, as we know, that didn't happen. The failure system was bailed out to the tune of now over $20 trillion worldwide, and all the countries of the world, or many countries of the world, are now paying the, the piper for all this giveaway of the money, public money, to, to bail out this failed system. So we did have the turning point. We did have things have gotten really worse. We had gotten it to the point of complete financial collapse. We had the alternative before us. We had it completely relevant to our situation. And of course, it just uh, it failed at the at the central and the, and the leading level. And of course, we know why is because uh, Obama and the presidency itself was basically a brand change, and the presidency itself is controlled by Wall Street and the large corporations who have really no concern about the American people. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Hence, uh, what you refer to as the <clears throat> cancer stage of capitalism. <laughs> well, you, yes, I know people. Uh, I, I originally came out with this concept. I was asked by a public health journal from the United States, centered in uh, San Francisco, um, and this public health journal asked me to write a. They were doing a special 
special issue and asked me to write a, a, an article about what, how I understood, and this was back in the 1990s, hmm. how I understood the problems that we were going through and how it connected to public health. And it was at that point that I was prompted to follow through on an intuition I'd had is that this, this system is behaving very much like a cancer. Uh, a carcinogenic circuitry at the social level of life organization. And actually the people who were refereeing the paper were actually medical people and, and there was a lot of resistance to uh, taking it from, you know, uh, you know, I'm saying this isn't a metaphor, this isn't, a, this isn't imagery. Um, the image is good, but it's, it's much deeper than that. <clears throat> Just as we have laws of physics that operate at different levels of uh, reality, uh, you know, at the, across life organization and across entities that aren't alive and so forth, so we can have laws within life organization that operate in the same way. And, and then if we start to consider what are the hallmark characteristics, the defining characteristics of a reproduction and the invasion of a car carcinogenic circuit, and the more one got into that and then uh, brought it at to the social level of life organization, that is, it isn't cellular, it isn't gen genetically determined, that it's at another level of life organization. So it isn't uh, as if we're, I'm having an organic metaphor that some people might understand it, well, I'm seeing society as an organism. No, I'm seeing it as a social a social life organization. That means it isn't determined by... Um, it isn't determined by genetic circuits. It's determined by ultimately value systems and right. social value systems, not individual value systems. They're usually derivative from the social value system. Exactly. And then if you have at the social level of life organization, if you have a reproduction circuit that's growing and it's growing exponentially, once you see exponential growth, you see carcinogenic possibility. There's something gone wrong. And if you see that that growth, and of course what it is, is you know in place of what we call the cancer sequence, what it always does is reproduce its own itself, really the not self of the body. It reproduces cancer cells which are deformed and uh, don't have any committed function to the life host, and that's the real key. <clears throat> There's no committed function to the life host. Now, these money sequences, these private money sequences, seek only like a cancer. They seek only to multiply themselves without inhibition, and they have no committed function to the life host. Well, of course, that ends up in disaster, and that's what happens at the bodily level, and that's what happens at the social level. We have not been able to impose any committed function to life host uh, requirements of life. Uh, for example, say with the climate destabilization that we we reduce our carbon, you know, it, it does, you know, they'll just turn it into another money sequencing to turn into more money without right. uh, without inhibition. And the key is not only that it doesn't have any uh, committed function to the life host. <clears throat> It isn't recognized by the surrounding community. Now, in, this, in the body level, the surrounding cell community, you know, it's cells. And uh, they recognize, I mean, it's really quite a remarkable thing the way we all have cancer going on in our bodies all the time. There are cancers there. But the social immune system is able to recognize the, uh, the cancer. Uh, and that's the big problem is not only that you have a cancer growing and multiplying uh, without committed function, but you also have no recognition at the surrounding life level of what has gone wrong. In fact, it recognizes these cancer cells, which is just money sequencing becoming more private money without limit until it dominates everything. Um, there's no recognition of it. And, of course, what's happened there is that the corporate mass media are, in fact, part of the cancer. And, of course, Wall Street is at the very center of the propagation of the cancer. And they are not going to allow any recognition. They, you know, it's inconceivable to them. They're behaving like a cancer, but it's inconceivable to them that they could possibly recognize this. 
And so it isn't recognized by the surrounding social immune system. Now, our social immune system at the social level of life organization isn't. I mean, I could go into the mechanics that go on at the bodily level. It's really quite amazing. You know, the, what happens is that you have macrophage cells that recognize that there's something right, wrong, and they, so to speak, and they rip, the, they tear the genetic marker off the, uh, the cell, the uh, rogue cell, and they display it to the surrounding cell community and then there's a response a biochemical response that uh, triggers into action uh, precisely the antibody uh, precisely the uh, the action of the body to get rid of that uh, those cells and right. uh, those are called T cells from the thymus the thymus gland and one could go through and through it how oh, it's just really quite miraculous how this happens sure, but the sure. key when it happens is that you recognize that it is a cancer and I've had cancer myself and that was a real the, the most difficult thing was getting the body to recognize the growth and come after it and but that hasn't happened so it then just continues to attack all our life means support systems to pr reproduce itself at the higher and higher levels of uh, multiplication and it appropriates ever more of the life host nutrients for its own growth and then it unlimitedly multiplies its own non-productive demands of growth and that's what they're always saying we must have growth we must have growth it's just the cancer meta program has entered into the very command posts of the of the uh, the social system and so then you have the needs and goods, therefore, of the life hosts are displaced at every level, whether your food is going, you know, has carcinogenic components or you're not managing uh, any level of the climate reproduction system or whatever. Uh, it just keeps on taking over those, like, for example, the carbon credit uh, uh, Right. fraud that has been going on it's just that what it does is repeat the money sequence reproduction and multiplication every time it faces a problem then it metastasizes across the life host across borders and that's really what these free so-called free trade basically it's the free movement of private money sequences to control everything across the planet and across borders and so it eventually exhausts by the deprivation and the dysfunction and exhausts the life host, and that's the stage we're in now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> You've made the so comment. It's not a uh, metaphor. Oh no, I, I absolutely yeah. agree, and I think, uh, for example, the community, community that you're speaking with is our hope to be the social immune system, or one of many yeah. attributes of it to rise up against this before it's too late. You've mm -hmm. used the term money sequence a few times. For the, for the listeners that aren't familiar, would you define money sequence versus the life sequence? Yeah, well, it's and yet you, this all uh, you know be, became uh, it has more generic application, uh, but. Because you could have a money sequence, I suppose, that was instrumental to the life sequence. But let me just go through the life sequence of value first. It's very, very simple and straightforward. It's just basically you have a life host or you have a life um, structure and that that uh, or life means and but whatever form of life it is it goes through means of life it must have means of life we must breathe every second and we must have water and so forth it must have means of life to become more life that is to continue as life and to at best biodiversify and become more intelligent at the human level and so the life sequence is just life through means of life to more life life through means of life at the best, not only to reproduction, but more flourishing life, you know, more, uh, and then I, I really get into what the, all that means, but we don't need to do that right now, but basically it's thought, action, and felt side of being, and it becomes more flourishing life, so we have life through means of life to more life, and that circuit uh, re reproduces itself forever, I mean, that's really, you know, from the primitive protoplasm to now. Right. Now what we have is a money sequence that happens. Well, it's happened really through civilized, uh, through civilized societies to some extent, that we've had this money sequence, and it's private. That is, it's only for uh, private owners, and they turn money through life as means into more money for themselves to do it, more money returning to themselves to more money, to more money, to more money, and that becomes the money sequence of value. 
So you could have the exchange medium as we have in the ordinary, you know, the market, the traditional market, where people, you know, their direct producers sell their organic food and handicrafts, and it's the labor of those who own and sell it. And it's, um, you know, it's basically labor intensive, and it's local individuals with their personal knowledge and so on. And you have money that acts as a an exchange medium between their product and someone's purchase of it for their own lives. At that point, money is not a problem. Money is actually very useful for people to convert what they can do into what others can do for them through an exchange medium. But what happens with the money sequence of value? It ceases to be an exchange medium uh, for exchange of means of life uh, for uh, people who to produce for one another and to have the uh, the means of life they require and have the means of exchange available to them, it changes into sheer money multiplication. It has no life function. It has no, it doesn't even as we, and the real cancer stage started happening when it no longer needed anything of of, uh, of concrete life value or anything of value at all uh, to as a middle term. It just turns, this is the derivative moment, it turns money into more money for private money possessors without doing anything, without providing any function. And, of course, that's gotten into the level of just, well, you know, trillions and trillions of dollars a day are being uh, manufactured in this way where they have no committed function, they produce nothing whatsoever. So that's the money sequence that takes off as autonomous and uh, exponentially multiplying, it serves no function whatsoever, but is only evaluated on how much money it returns to its private possessors. And that's the only objective going. And that's called growth. <laughs> and that's right. called profit returns. And that is affirmed even as it eats away the body of, uh, of the society. Well, let me extend that, that question a little bit because you touched upon the market system. Obviously, you viewed the, the work that you participated in, Zeitgeist, moving forward, and there's a series of critiques that are made to the market system as being intrinsically inefficient in kind of a very fundamental way. For instance, we have the application of cost efficiency where a corporation needs to cut corners to produce so it can compete, compete with other corporations that are cutting corners. And do you feel that such such flaws in the ability to produce what you could consider correctly in a scientific way being inhibited by the need to preserve and cut back on cost efficiency. Do you feel well, that those components I think are you're going to the yeah, I think you're going to the heart of the matter with saying there's something gone there's something deranged in what we're counting as a cost here. Right. And you're seeing one of the manifestations of the deranged notion of cost and one of the manifestations is that that you you don't have you know you don't have um, long-lasting uh, goods for example uh, perfected goods because you want to have a market that you can keep ca continuing to sell to and you want right. to have it sold for a low cost for maximum profit and so forth I agree with all that but it's the problem is deeper in the very notion of cost itself. Cost itself only means in this system, I'm talking about high theory economics, I'm talking about Samuelson's uh, text of economics, virtually everything you see written on so-called economics is really diseconomics, is, um, is, is that cost simply means cost to investor. That means money cost to money sequencers. That's how you right. decode it. All they mean by cost is money cost to money sequencers. And they want to reduce money cost to money sequencers, and they want to amplify, you know, produce as much possible of money returns or revenues over cost. But it's always only in money terms within the private money self-multiplying sequence, money sequence. And so if you understand cost in that way, then not only are you going to have the problem that you've identified, you're going to have problems at every level because you don't count any life costs in. Right. It's absolutely life blind. So you don't count the cost. Well, supposing we sell uh, this junk food, for example, and it causes all these problems with obesity and so on, uh, cancer <clears throat> through all the carcinogens and so forth. Well, that just doesn't compute to the system. All, there, all it is concerned about, all it tracks, all it thinks in terms is does the money of the investor, is the cost 
for the money cost for producing a money profit is that as low as possible. End of story. So what happens to the labor doesn't matter. What happens to the consumer doesn't matter. What happens to the ecosystem doesn't matter. What happens to culture doesn't matter. It is structurally life blind. It excludes all costs from you. The only cost it takes into account is the money cost to the private money sequencer. End of story. So this predictably leads to the sorts of crises we've had over time. You know, you, nature is wonderfully resourceful and people are wonderfully able to carry on. Uh, but eventually, cumulatively over time, if you pay absolutely no attention to any cost but how much you know the money costs to private money sequencers, then virtually everything that should be being counted in is going to be destroyed. It's going to be cumulatively destroyed. And it's going to be so predictably. It's predictable in principle, and, of course, we just have confirmation of that happening all around us in all sorts of places that we hadn't thought to look, but that's what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. And another element of that life cost, which is the same fundamental inefficient train of thought on the life ground level, but yet efficient for the yeah. market system, is this sort of self-preservation of dominant institutions where you'll – have institutions that strategically limit efficiency or stifle competition, if you will, something that might be a better good or service, something that might be yeah. more sustainable even, because sustainability very often is the enemy of a consumption system that we have today. Right. So you have this paralyzation, it's paralyzed, so scientific inquiry, development yeah. of a renewable it's energies, worked. obviously, which we could have done a long, long time ago. It's stifled, and I, I think that's another extension of that. Would you agree? Yes, indeed. But I would say, you know, and when we go to which institutions are, you know, um, preserved and multiplied and which institutions aren't, then we go beneath the institutional issue to, again, the single same dominant selector. The right. main prime ultimate selector is whether it adds money revenues to private money sequencers. End right. of story. Exactly. No, I and so agree. that's what's happened to the university, for example. I, you know, come from the university, right. and um, the what's happened there is basically it's all turned into money sequencing. You, it, administration replaces the capitalists, and you can predict everything they're going to do. Does it bring more money into central administration? Then they will select for it. If it doesn't bring more money uh, into central administration, it doesn't matter how original research it is, it doesn't matter what breakthrough is happening, it will not be selected for approval. And so you have the same system has now gone into the institution of the university. The one thing that you might say is the key to the social immune system, recognizing basic underlying patterns that aren't seen on the face of things, that's what research and university and professors should be about. And right. indeed, in some cases are, but basically that's all being selected out. And so we have the problem right in front of our eyes at the university institution level happening. And that, I don't know how many people are really aware that that's what's happening to the university. Certainly, um, certainly this is an unspeakable within the university. Now, I've been, I've been talking this a lot, and more people are talking about it. But basically, what you'll find is the community inside the university, they have a good thing going. Each of the individuals is highly competitive, you know. I mean, uh, even in when I got hired, there was 200 other people applying for the job that all had their PhDs, etc., uh, now it's even worse in the sense of just extremely competitive. And what is selected for are the people that are going to serve basically outside money sequences and, and bring in funding. And those people don't want to hear what you've got to say. You're the enemy if you say this thing. And the people who don't want to be in it, who are, say, in a field that hasn't been completely taken over, like philosophy, they're afraid of saying anything less. They might lose their job or the administrators are going to be because, you know, it all has a, it's a systematic renewal every year. It's thought that tenure guarantees. But, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a basic selection process going on all the time about whether you get a raise whether you get a promotion, 
uh, whether you uh, get so much added to your pension possibilities. Every year this is going on, and if you offend anybody inside the cabals of the system who are all in turn basically, uh, with noble exceptions, are all basically bound to the money sequence system, then they're just afraid it'll be hard for their career. So you basically have individual careerists not real thinkers and researchers, but individual careerists who think also in money terms, and they're keeping their mouths shut if or their eyes shut, one or the other. And so institutions are, it's not just institution as such, like my friend John Ralston Saul has thought, well, you know, the institutions are the problem. No, but they, they, you've got to go back down to what the causal mechanism behind the corruption of the institution. The same thing's going on in health, public health care, and, you know, research or hospital uh, account system. It's all about how much money they bring in, and that's it. And so that starts being the selector for everything at every level. And so the one places where we had made huge breakthroughs since 1945 in particular, through science, public science, basically within public universities, and public health, you know, medical uh, medical research uh, was basically public. That's all been privatized, and it's all privatized basically parasitic on the university and parasitic on health institutions in order to make them subjugated entirely to the private money sequence. Just as an example here of the way it could be. Sure. The, Benjamin Franklin, you know, was it? I mean, he talked... <laughs> He, he he was a he was a smart fellow and uh, you know very high ranking fellow we all know him as a founding father and he invented the Franklin stove now that was a huge money earner in the sense of him having a patent or copyright on it he knew that was a possibility he just refused he said everything should enter into the public domain that's the whole point of human progress is that intellectual discoveries pass into the community as what's being done for that's the way the human race has evolved and so he didn't take uh, though the possibility was there he didn't want copyright or, or any protection on his patent he just wanted people to have a good stove when they didn't have a good stove and in fact that's what drives every researcher really is that yeah. they want to do something for humanity and the field they're, they're uh, well basically it's the field they're in they want to make a contribution that's what really drives them and, of course, all that has just been privatized in our lifetimes, you know. This has all happened quite recently. That is basically, you know, since the late 1980s, since all this whole system started coming in. It started working on the university where the universities could produce their knowledge product for patent um uh, uh, Dole, Bob Dole was part of the, you know, one of the founders of that in that bill, which started basically turning the mo universities into money machines at the same time as they withdrew public funding. Make them go. In fact, the presidents of our university joined together with the business community in called a business roundtable, uh, and actually its acronym was BOSS, and it just. They recommended, the university presidents themselves, they recommended to governments that they uh, reduce public funding for universities to force the researchers into serving the corporate market. They did it, wow. along wow. with the businessmen. And now they were doing it in Canada. That was across the country. And at the you know, but they were being led by the states. The states had already done this and was moving in the same direction. Now that whole understanding of what's happened to the university, even as somebody who's a researcher like yourself, I'm not sure that you would know it, or most people do know it. But all, all that stuff was really rather remarkably planned. And yeah. the the key is through the money sequencing itself. Everybody needs money. That's why you want to get out of the money system. Uh, everybody needs money to survive as an institution or as an individual. And so just take away their money. Right. And then you're, though, you're going to be dependent on the private money sequencers, and that's what's going on in Greece at this very moment, what the people are rebelling about. And this is this has actually all been uh, has all been planned, and that's really one of the the really sinister things about it. You can see how it's quite planable, and it has been planned. 
And, uh, you know, Rockefeller has said, uh, David Rockefeller at the Bildersberg Institute, well, I think that the, uh, you know, the, an elite of uh, bankers and, uh, and um, um, I think he called them researchers or academics, I guess is what his term was. Bankers and academics are fitter to run uh, nations than the past auto-determination of societies in past centuries. Right, so he, yeah. he he said that in 1991 at the Beldersburg, it was you know leaked, yep. and so and, and you know his his father or his grandfather was saying, well you know it's a law of poverty is a law of God. This is the way of selecting for a higher human race. So you really you see something that has been in play for a long time has crystallized, and I think the real turning point came in the 1979-1980 with Thatcher and Reagan who were basically money sequence fanatics to decode their meaning. And uh, they didn't think that the, anything existed of value other than a, what they call the market, but basically it's just private money sequencing. And so they forced everything to come into line with that or you were broken, whether you were the air controller or whether you were the miners or whether you were the sociology department in universities or didn't matter who, or whether you were Nicaragua or right. Costa Rica or uh, Iraq, as it's turned out, or you know uh, the formerly socialist Yugoslavia. Just break them, kill them, and uh, that's what they did. And we're living in the after effects. Yeah, absolutely. I have interviewed prior a man named John Perkins. You might be familiar with him. Oh, yes. Yes, he well, he he's a, talks very clearly about the use of debt pressure to basically break these countries and break these Oh, yeah, and murder, too. I mean, he's you oh, know, absolutely. I was a hitman for the, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you made a great point regarding what essentially is a value system disorder, that people in power yeah, are these amalgams of this distortion. And one thing that I wanted to point out in passing that you had commented on was how privatization is really the next level of this growth cancer that we have, because they have to keep spreading to different yes. areas. So yes. water supplies, public health, this is to be expected. Education. Yes. 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 Yeah, and, uh, that, and, and privatization is its only way. It's all the frontiers have really been, uh, you know, you can't take over other people's societies so easily. You already have. You don't have anything more to take, uh, except if it happens to be Libya or if it happens to be Iraq, and they're still taking other societies, uh, basically, you know, subjugating and genociding them uh, in order to turn them into private money sequencing and then call it freedom. Now, that's really right. the inner logic of the whole uh, the whole system. So, but you know, it goes way back to, to Adam Smith. I'm just going to give you a quote from Adam Smith. Uh, he says, if I can uh, uh, find it here, um, he says, and, and, and I'm just going to read something here because it's really very interesting. Sure. He he affirms really the set point of the whole life blind system. Now, these, incidentally, you know, his book, uh, The Wealth of Nations, or inquiry into the wealth of nations um it was printed at the same year that the american revolution occurred i don't know if you knew that 1776 okay and okay. i don't think that's sort of i think that's a sort of a historical uh, turning point that's really huge and he says right and he was a philosopher you know he was a moral philosopher and he was a good uh, philosopher and he was the first guy to try to understand economics um really and, uh, from philosophy and he did a you know he did a really incredible uh, job of understanding the market system as it then existed which you know didn't really have corporations he didn't believe in the corporation but he said in it, you know in his wealth of nations very famous statement he says it's an obvious and simple system of natural liberty which establishes itself of its own accord that is the market system and of course there has been traditional markets but they're a different thing than uh, what they are now in fact they're the opposite every man so long as he does not violate the laws of justice and basically there's no laws of justice but market exchange itself and Smith right is left perfectly free to pursue his own interest, his own way, and the sovereign is therefore discharged from the duty, the sovereign meaning government, is discharged from the duty of superintending the industry of private people. Now that notion is very much, as you know, alive today. It's being it's sort of proclaimed from the rooftops. Right. Um, so then you say, well, that, you know... Um, that all makes sense, and it does make uh, sense. But then you notice, even in Smith, uh, 
it doesn't make sense, of course, if you look deeper. But this is something that's never quoted from Smith, but what he says when he talks about the labor process. He says, um, well, you know, when it comes to the issue of mass starvation of children, he, you know, that's no problem for him. In fact, it's evolution. He, he, was, he had a proto-evolutionary theory. And so he said, uh, without a blink of concern for the mass homicidal effects, he said, among, and this is a direct quote, that, you know, and it was all run by an invisible hand. He was a deist. He believed in, you know, that God had made, I don't know whether you're familiar with that notion of a deist, but what it means is the world is a perfect machine, a perfect mechanism that's made by God and, to, and is to run on its own. That's God's will, and that's called uh, a deism, and that's very much alive today, only with a vengeance. And he says, direct quote, among the inferior ranks of people, notice doesn't you know there are inferiors right. sure. amongst the inferior ranks of people the scanty scantiness of subsistence can set limits to the further multiplication of the human species and it can do so in no other way than uh, by destroying a great part of the children which their fruitful marriages produce so adam smith had already seen the the mass murder or killing of children, the mass homicide of children is just fine. That was all part of the evolutionary process to a higher thing. So we're dealing with a value system. He knew it was a value system. You know, that denial is just a joke. Really, it starts to happen at the turn of the 20th century when they realize that nobody can really believe in this value system. They pretend it's value neutral, uh, which is, you know, very much a profound, it's a horrible joke. Um, but that was quite... That was a cost that we're quite willing to pay, yeah. the mass homicide of children. And there's nothing in market doctrine today, or as it's so-called market doctrine, there's nothing in all of the theories of uh, economics today that rules this out. You so we st the only thing that rules it out is a political intervention that happens through, and especially happened after the Depression and the, and the Second World War, political interventions happened, and people said, we're not going to go on with this. It doesn't work. They knew that, and, this, you know, 25% unemployment and so forth. It doesn't work. We're going to have to have, and Keynes was part of this, and saying you're going to have to have a public investor here, or you're not going to get the system working again. And uh, so that's what happened, and we did get a lot of social things come in. We had public education, we had public health care, and on and on it went. And we had uh, life security, social life security, and all the programs that they're now stripping and privatizing came in because it was recognized you can't go on killing hundreds of millions of people. You can't go on doing that. It's not right. And so the uh, economists will pretend it's not a value system, but there it is. It's about as big a value system as you can get. It's saying a value is to prefer a principle of preference. We're going to prefer the deaths of hundreds of thousands and millions of children uh, to, for uh, money, profit, and com you know, commodity increase. That's a value judgment, and that's built right into the system. So one of the biggest problems I had in coming, you know, coming to this understanding over years, was that uh, is dealing with what you said the the uh, pretense of um, uh, neutrality that this is value free, this is value neutral, and so forth. That that idea even Marx swallowed that idea, and uh, he he wanted to say there's no values involved at all. Values are just uh, you know ideological mishmash usually behind which you know, so many bourgeois interests are going to ambush you. He knew something had gone terribly, terribly wrong, but he could not see that the mechanism itself was a value system and understand it, therefore, since it's a value system, it's alterable. It, it, you know, it's a human construct. It's a social construct, not only a social construct, but it's a social construct that runs entirely on ultimately regulating principles of preference. And the principle of preference here is to turn money into more money for private money possessors. End of story. No cost of anything else matters. And that's been going on for centuries. And we, right. of course, have all the genocide of the first peoples, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as, you know, in the wake of this basically a homicidal uh, world machine. 
it can't be understood this way though as you know that's just too much to uh, face but that's what your movement is doing and that's what more and more people will of course the, the understanding has uh, the understanding has been intuitively available for a long time uh, we now understand it in principle and we can be very very i can be very exact formal i can put it into formal notations and the rest of it uh, and we we do have that available to us what we haven't really come to is an understanding that indeed it is a value system and it's not freedom it's actually subjugation what it does do though and this is the value i think that really appeals to people <clears throat> and it did at the beginning was that it gives them commodities that were not uh, otherwise available I mean that's what capitalism did and that's why it took off in the beginning it was you know basically sheep were the central commodity and then it became slaves but you know both of them together but what you produced was food and clothing through as I say the, the first primary commodity of sheep <clears throat> You produced more food and clothing than was otherwise available, and you did it through this uh, this private money sequencing with they, they had an incentive to organize to do this and uh, so for the heyday of capitalism uh, money capitalism is not really capitalism it's not really capital it's money sequencing that's why I insist on those terms. Capital right. is wealth that produces more wealth this doesn't produce more wealth it produces more money demand on wealth, but at the beginning. It produced more food and clothing, and so that was the great success of capitalism and through you know the organization of labor into dividing the process of production into its uh, constituent phases and so forth. These were very, very important technological developments that produced commodities. And then at a certain point, you started seeing, well, there isn't enough market uh, room left for producing food and clothing. We're going to have to get into other things. And then with no life regulations and any life regulations, life standards we have being removed uh, for efficiency, that is reduced costs for private money sequencers, then you produce anything at all. You've, and so what we've found, as you've already observed, is what we've found is that virtually every level of production, inferior products are being turned out. Right. And uh, because it sells well, and it's cheaper to make, and uh, take food, which is one of the primary ones. And uh, I think clothing probably and things like running shoes have actually, uh, well, I've certainly noticed running shoes have gotten better, but it's at the cost of a kind of slave labor and pollution and the rest of it. And so you really realize that the system, you know, that thinks it's the most efficient system in the history of humanity is really, by objective accounting principles, is really the most systematically inefficient right. system in the history of humanity. But we... And, and Go Absolutely, ahead. and it appears that we are having to increase that increase that inefficiency as time moves forward. Yes, and yes. this brings us to a later question that I, I commented on regarding this advanced uh, advanced movement of of the growth in technology and science, where we're able to automate so much now, displacing the labor force at increasing rates. Uh, so what does that mean? It means that we have to find more jobs, more things to produce. For people, and, and the, the sickness, the sickness of it all to me. I mean, everyone now has bottled water. Even pollution becomes a profitable thing. Any problems yeah. become problems. Well, we want to service things. We don't want to resolve anything. No, no, yeah. because as you've uh, pointed out, if you if you destroy the life goods in nature in the community, and by your own uh, system of say carcinogenic inputs into foods and so forth then you create a new market demand for other products to deal with what you've just uh, created as as a problem so it's what i called long ago uh, a a death spiral and that language right. one of our leading political scientists at a con learning conference who was discussing the book he says this is prophecy, you know, and he didn't mean it positively. He meant, you know, I had gone over the edge in the sense of discussing, uh, describing this thing by calling it a death spiral. And I said, well, actually, let's just look at the mechanics of its cumulative movement and uh, outcomes. And it does. And the more it creates uh, destruction and despoiliation of lives, the more it creates new market demands for something to 
respond to these problems. And one of the biggest things it's produced is, uh, in the way of despoliation of people's lives, is cancer itself. Right. And uh, cancer itself, as we know, grows and grows and grows. And uh, though they, you know, they find ways of treating it. Now, those ways they have of treating it are new markets for new goods, for new uh, pharmaceuticals, for new surgical instruments, for new, you know, the whole HMO, uh, health maintenance organization business is the hugest in the world. It's 14% sure. of your product, of your whole GDP. Uh, well, it's all based on basically treating the symptoms and uh, bad effects, the deleterious effects. Effects, disease-causing effects of the of the products themselves and the processes of production. So long ago, people like Epstein, Samuel Epstein, who's written on these matters, for example, in CancerGate, uh, recognized that you know the real cancer, the cancer that's being produced, is not being examined. All we're going down is looking at the victims. We're looking at the the individual life hosts that are afflicted with it, and it's a terrible, terrible disease. Oh, awful awful and so what all you're doing is treating the victims and you're not looking at the cause of it well we know through research is increasingly shown that over 85 maybe over 90 percent of all the cancers are environmentally induced whether it's uh, tobacco or carcinogens or not tobacco really those concoctions that they put that are full of uh, poison Um, you know you know what that yeah I mean the reason people get a hit out of smoking is it's a, it's a chemical f- a threat to the body the body goes into an immune system alarm at what has been introduced all these toxins and you know all the toxins that are in there I mean it's paint thinner, every kind of thing is in there, uh, is in order to deliberately stimulate the immune system into an alarm response, and that's the high from smoking. Right. And, and so that breaks down the body if you do it, not either through the toxins or through the problem with you know everything that, that does when you just keep alarming the uh, the immune system in this way, and so it breaks it breaks down. And so now, well, no problem. We've just got HMOs and we've got uh, <laughs> everything to take care of that. And what we'll never do, what the Cancer Institute will never do, is discuss the environmental causes of cancer. Right. And so you well, just have a reproductive cycle that just grows and grows. Of yeah, there's no address of any, any core problems at all. For to do so would pretty much void uh, this, the basic mechanisms of the system we have. To bring this down to a very concentrated train of thought, what we have, and tell me if you agree or not, we have a value system disorder that has been born out of a system that's basically transmutated itself from very simple market exchange and then with the advancement of technology, we've been displacing labor. We find the need for more and more new jobs. We have a growth paradigm that's emerged. We're using debt. So it, it feels to me that the majority of the problems and the, the train of thought that goes to the corporations, the circular reasoning, all of this is born out of a, a core systemic concept that is basically not applicable or not really not efficient, obviously, but not uh, not socially viable, not life ground viable. Do you feel that that logical, yeah. exactly? But do you feel it's sourced at the very core, or do you feel that it could be salvaged? The market system could be salvaged to support the life ground as you see it. Well, you know that's. I mean, that is. A, uh, that I, I I think that uh, we can do things. We can do things that can turn it around uh, overnight if we uh, decide to. And right. for example, the way I was discussing when we had that financial crash, and it showed that the financial system was not so-called financial system was not working because it's a pure money sequencing system that's exploitative, et cetera, et cetera. Then we had right there. We had the issue of how and inability to uh, provide a money uh, exchange system whereby people can have houses without being broken and that uh, there we can have a financial system that can continue to exist without uh, completely um, you know collapsing and collapsing people's lives with it so if we just responded ad hoc you know to the problems as they were created 
we could supposing that what I'd said had had happened that it, that just said well I, you know we're going to take over the funding of housing this is within government's purview we have the constitutional grounds to do this and you you know the, the system has failed and we just simply must have a remedy and if they had done that. Um, then we really would have had a very, very important turn at the center of the system. Uh, sure. With carbon, you know, one worries a bit that they're putting all the problems of ecocide, and basically it's an ecocidal system. It's destroying, envir- you know, ecological reproduction at virtually every level. I mean, just think of the species. You know, the species are going extinct at a thousand times, and people are now saying two thousand times the background evolutionary rate it's uh you know and, and the word is they use extinction spasm so we have an extinction spasm going on here and we also have destabilized our hydrological and climate cycles they never say that of course they call it under euphemisms sure. like global warming you know um we, that we'll just we'll, we'll introduce life standards that ensure we don't go on doing that and you could so you would do say it, that Right, you could sorry, do the life you... standards by putting it right inside these uh, these trade now trade and investment diktats by corporations who write all the terms and whose the the only rights are, that are protected there are of money investors the only rights protected in any of this international machinery it's quite an amazing fact thousands of pages protect nobody's rights sure, money to sure. anything except their rights to have uh, profit and money and they can sue governments if they don't have it. just put Put in, just put in we, as they already did, you know. And so the the only term that protects anything is that you have the ozone layer, and that the ozone layer protocol is something that a government can make a decision in light of that that they can't be sued for uh, infringing upon the corporate's uh, opportunities of profit. They right. just say, oh well, it's not just the ozone layer in trouble here. We have, uh, you know, we have a species extinction spasm that's in trouble. We have sure. a climate destabilization, and uh, what are we know the causal mechanisms? And so we just put in terms. We have actually we we've, we've developed I mean, we've developed instruments at the international level to reduce the amount of say carbon that we're putting into the atmosphere. And the, the way you do it is just say, I'm sorry, you can't bring your good into this province into this country you can't export your good against uh, across borders unless it complies with trade regulations and these regulations include life protective protocols and right. uh, sorry and you put it right at the beginning so they have they have an incentive either they conform and comply or they don't export and of course the whole thing is being now driven by the exports and capital can't make its profits now of course that makes perfect sense but why haven't we heard more about it and the real point here i'm saying is that we could turn it around really very quickly if you had any kind of real leadership happening at the at the top and uh, we haven't so instead of just saying let's get rid of money altogether as i know you know i can understand that advocacy we rather speak to the problems that we now have that are huge they are lethal deadly world sure. you know it's the, the whole world's involved here we speak to those problems in a sensible way and we introduce life standards and we introduce uh, you know, for example, with respect to uh, you know all the problems of that are from the processes and products of our uh, of our money sequencing uh, production system, and then let people adapt. Now, we have done this in the past, and it has worked. So uh, what has happened is all that stuff that we've done in the past, which has worked, has been rolled back and stripped back and, and eliminated, and it's in the process. All this crisis, is, they just, instead of solving the problem, they just advance like uh, Klein, Naomi Klein says in her Disaster Capitalism, they just use the disaster they've created as the reason to uh, make it more totalitarian and life-destructive than before. And that that's sure, the sure. actual modus operandi that's quite documentable, and she's done a great job of documenting it. Well, I, I completely agree um, with the transitional steps <coughs> and the, the urgency of where we are today, but don't you feel from a more or less a philosophical perspective that the state intervention is really an attempt to thwart natural tendencies 
of what this system has turned into being. And with that train of thought, wouldn't it, you know, at the very core, and this is what we advocate with our removal of the monetary system, getting straight to resource distribution, removing the mechanisms of profit, total earth management to understand what we have, what we're doing. Don't you feel yeah. that such, a, such an approach in the end game, if you will, is really where we should be headed to just get away from the mechanisms and the tendencies and essentially the value system disorder that's manifest? Yeah, well, I, uh, it's just, you know, we've tried the, the sort of all or nothing approach has been tried, you know, uh, now not the way you're uh, describing it. And what sure. we find is that unexpected, uh, unintended uh, consequences occur. So for Marx, you know, he, he thought that, um, you know, if we just had the working class ownership, which would basically turn out in a way uh, uh, as p public ownership, but we have working class collective ownership of the means of production, then we're, uh, and we need to, to do that, we're going to have to have a dictatorship of the proletariat, but that's, a, you know, that's needed. We've had dictatorships before, etc. And then we got a, an abortion like the uh, Soviet system uh, coming out of that. And I, I use the term abortion sort of deliberately. The, the, the sure. you know, the Marx talked about the birth prangs of, of society producing a new order, and he really understood it as a wholly new life organization coming into play. And if you look over history, basically, it's more a stitch by stitch process. Though I've I've often been, uh, you know, very impressed by revolutionary. Uh, but how many of them actually have worked when you tried to do everything at once? Uh, sure. Better work with what with you. you've got, with the, the ideals. You see, the value. We're not disagreeing on any values here. Right. Um, and that's that's you're right. That's the key, and that's the basis. That's the ultimately regulating uh, system of the whole global uh, structure. And it's what basically I think it's by rules. Humans are the rule-making creature. I mean, that's what distinguishes us from the animals who are basically confined to their instinctual repertoires and sequences. And uh, they can't, um, you know, they don't have rules, basically. And we were able and have been able, that's basically distinguished us, we've been able to make rules either implicitly or explicitly to regulate us. And we've made rules of every kind, uh, rules that actually are good, like you can't go killing members of your community or, or disabling them. Uh, you can't uh, take away people's uh, means of contingent existence from them because you want it, etc. We have all, uh, even rules against uh, uh, you know, fraudulent and lying behavior and so forth, all our successes have been based on good rules, and I just say that the rules are always of one type or another. They always serve the life sequence, they either protect life or they enable life in ways that weren't possible without the rules. And sure. if we continue on, we've got a bad rule system now, and we have to re we have to reset the rule system in order to uh, protect and enable human and ecological life, what we're dependent on. Uh, and th then it's a matter of how we how we do that, you know, and where do we sure. move first? Well, I say we move first on those areas which are most disastrous if we don't move first. It's telling us where we must move first by the disaster that's being uh, constructed here. And now, of course, you may be, uh, you know, when you say, well, you know, we can – we can we can make this all a technically uh, manageable system where we know instead of going through the exchange medium, I understand the argument. We don't go through the exchange medium. We go. We know this family needs such such and such. They're already ordering things on their computers and so forth. We know what uh, we, what education the kids need. You know, to access the public schools and we. And the, the thing is to get clear on what what are real means of life that we can assign to allocate. So the principle right. of allocation is everything here. And you're saying, well, let's skip the, let's just skip the money exchange and allocate where it's needed. And I would say two things here. Let's be very careful about what we understand what's needed. I, I can give a criterion of what's needed. And uh, let's see what we're working with already to see if we can reset what we've already evolved to be um, you know, to provide those that life productive and life enabling possibility for the life sequence of value for the planet, and um, 
So you work with what you've got. The other sure. Lao says, you know, it's the longest journey has its first step. So we work with what we got. Now it may be that we eventually go that way. I mean, basically, my my life and your life, I don't know. It's just right. basically it's all technologically allocated because of what I've earned in the past, um, and uh, to uh, uh, you know various. Uh, in my case, uh, I have a pension fund, and uh, it just automatically ducks I don't have to do in fact I hardly do any money exchanging is anymore so I realize the possibility but sure. to get there knowing what the the real needs are the life protective and life enabling needs are and you know what the criterion is it's quite simple and it works with everything you know people are always saying it's part of our problem you can't tell the difference between a need and a desire one person's want is another person you know etc well you can it just is that without which life capacity is reduced that's always right. what a need is and nothing else but that is a need and gotcha. so you work from there and you just say well how can we technically manage this so that people get what they need but you also you know the the money thing too has been an incentive in order for people to do what needs to be done we have to uh they have to work for pay is really the i think that's almost the ultimate selling point of the system that even cuba's coming around to you know that no longer says raul castro can we say that cuba is a place where you don't have to work and so they're going to god help them they're going to the uh, the system uh, and relying on the money as an incentive to get people to do the work that must be done otherwise they won't do it and that's the ultimate selling point of the system and sure. how are you going to get around that i myself have never worked for the money of it i think most people you know who have jobs they really contribute to the you know it's it doesn't it's not really the issue but well, for a lot that, of people it is and uh in this yeah well, in the yeah. culture that we have now, and I know you have to go very soon, so I'll be very yeah. brief. In the culture we have, obviously the monetary incentive has been deeply drilled into them, and it's in fact decoupled incentive because it's for monetary gain as opposed to sustenance of life or actually filling needs. Yeah. And I think you know there there could be a lot of arguments made with respect to what a new incentive system could be in a society that was organized to actually take care of its populace as opposed to. Yeah kind of competitive nature that we have. One thing I also want to comment on, you know, you talk about the immediate need for there to be very very deliberate actions, which I completely agree with against the severe problems that are emerging, but as as I think, well, I know you know, the the government institution really is an extension of this of this monetary yeah. uh, sequence and it's so hard obviously to get yeah. them to do anything, which is where we get this sort of the need yeah, for the rise of the grassroots of immune system. So I, I guess there's a certain cynicism with respect to using the state legislatures because all it takes, again, is a new administration to come in and overturn it, uh, and since it's still driven by money. So these are all important questions that yeah. we often talk about, which continues to yeah. lead our train of thought to the new rule system, as you point out, which is the new social structure based on resource management, deriving those values from nature itself as opposed to sort of a building upon arbitrary rule sets that, you know, historically have existed. Well, not, and just not building, to them you up. know, I use the language, I agree with you, it shouldn't be building on because sure. they need to be reset. Well, that's what happens now, unfortunately, but I agree with you. Exactly. They do need yeah, to be reset. They so should be based on... Example, the example, you know, the ones I've given, that we can reset. Like, I mean, we have had that. I mean, it used to be, for example, you know, the government, I mean, be, up until about 1970, there were no uh, foreign investment was uh, was basically through government loans, public loans. The rebuilding of Europe was under complete public control in order for it uh, for it to work. And that did actually work. And so we have a long we have a long track record of being able to do this. It's just that it's all been stripped sure. away through this magic thinking uh, theo capitalism. Right. And um, so yeah, that no, I, so it's not a you know the state the state especially in the United States it's an interesting thing. There seems to be a great suspicion of the state with good reason. Um, but the state has been capable of doing good things too. Uh, and you know, for example, Roosevelt's uh, New Deal. Uh, for example, you know, I mean, the, the sorts of things that came out of that, even though it's all been stripped back, you know, where you have basically life security for people and employment for people, 
um, it can go one way or another. There's a, uh, an evil state, uh, which I'm sorry that we're into now, basically just a corrupt uh, money sequencing uh, state for private individuals who are at the, at the trough. Right. And we can have a good public, instead of even thinking of it as a state, in fact, the sorts of solutions I'm depending are suprastate solutions. That is, through these trade and investment agreements, so-called, they're, you know, they're treaties, and they, you know, uh, they require everybody to comply with them. Well, we've seen that that works. That's the first time we've been able to cross borders and see that it works. And now we have the possibility of saying, well, let's put some good rules in there. Uh, and that that really is super state. But we need the rules, and we just we need the rules to be life protective and life enabling, rather than right. basically promoting money sequencing as the sole objective of the planet. Right, exactly. And I I would just say that comment that the rules should be derived from well should basically be explicit to a system approach, yeah, an approach that actually mirrors the way the world actually works. Of course. You know, it, all, the, all the things that make sense to you and I as far as, well, we should know how much we have. We should use our scientific understanding to allocate resources properly. We should make goods that last. You know, When all that stuff's put together, it seems to me and to many that are listening that there's a certain sort of self-evident nature, if you will, to what kind of natural system could emerge based on where we are today, based on where technology is, and then the rules would be derived from that. And I just want to clarify one thing with you is that we're not really trying to advocate a quantum leap into something in an immediate sense. We're trying to depict what and understand what the future could be, what yeah. these values support, what science technology teaches us, what our what our human needs really are and what and try to just get the public to understand that if if we could just maneuver our way up and approach that, uh, well, you that, know, that's okay, the direction we just should go. to go along with exactly what you're saying. Uh, to make clear where we're already past the money uh -huh. system, the private money exchange system. We're already past it in all the things that count, uh, sure. almost, and they're stripping it back. But the thing that matters most, and I've noticed this living, you know, I've traveled around the world, I've, you know, lived backpacked around the world and swam in the bloodstreams of the people through almost 100 countries. And um, I've also lived off the grid for years of my life. You need water supply. Right. You need sewers. Who's charging you a price to turn your tap on or flush your toilet? Nobody's charging you a price. You pay, you know, at the end of the year, you contribute whatever it is that uh, of the inputs or outputs that you uh, absorb. But basically, it's uh, nothing like what it's worth to you. We, we've already moved past the money system with, uh, with water supply. In fact, that's really what the modern civilization is based upon between mo you know, modern uh, water supply and, and sewer systems. Already past it. You know, well, I've also got to have something that interests me. Well, libraries with the books that we read. Well, I've got to be able to get around and walk around. Well, sidewalks. Who's who's out there, uh, you know, demanding uh, money for me to be on the sidewalk or selling right. futures in it? We've sure. all the same. We have already found what works beyond the money system, and it's all being stripped away from us. So right. I think yes, indeed. But you might say that you can go back to your ground, and I don't know whether you remember the concept, I call it the civil commons, and it's just right. basically civil institutions and language itself as its first form that provide a life good that's universally accessible. However you do it, it's a universally accessible and needed life good. Exactly. And we have done that to a huge extent. So you use that, which I what I call a civil commons model, as, well, first of all, you've got to hold on to what you've got because they're taking it as fast as they can. And sure. second of all, extend it, you know, so right. that we now, et cetera. Well, therein lies, uh, and this will be the final point because I know you have to go. We're, we're reaching yeah. the end of the program itself, and I appreciate you uh, extending your, your your stay here. But uh, the advancement of technology, we've there's so many automated systems now that could literally yeah. provide an abundance of food. So just like we had the water, just like we have the sidewalk, we can see that if we had the right focus uh, with our ingenuity, we could easily begin to provide things with no cost, with very little labor contribution. And that's the sort of train of thought that we're trying to move forward with, to create an abundance, an access abundance, to meet the needs of the human population and alleviate so many of the unnecessary pressures 
Uh, and this is sort of the direction that uh, we, we talk about in the movement. But I'd love to have you back on soon, and we can we can talk more about this if you have time, John. I really appreciate yeah, well, it. Yeah, <laughs> we have a lot of depth. No, it's been very enjoyable, Peter, and your que- yeah. the questions you pose are very good ones. Excellent. Well, I, I really appreciate it. Anything you'd like to say in closing? <laughs> no, except uh, uh, keep on going. Thank and, you. And, uh, you know, I think the act of understanding is the, is the primary act. Yeah, well, absolutely. What, what can we do if uh, people don't understand? Yeah, <laughs> that's We have a whole key. society of people that really don't understand. Yeah, I think that's, that's right. really the problem. Yeah. yeah, and they're not allowed to understand. It's basically kept off. I mean, I don't have a television set, for example. I don't buy any of the uh, media with advertising in it because I know I don't, it, this, I'm not going to be able to understand through those, those media. Yeah. And uh, so um, the act of understanding is really all because once the understanding and, you know, what is possible and how we do it that is self-evident, then it isn't going to be based on any command system. It's what, you know, it is self-evident and this is the way we need to move. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you very much. We'll we'll be in touch. Take My care, pleasure. Tom. Bye for now. Okay. Goodbye. Uh, Dr. John McMurtry, I really appreciate him coming. We have uh, two more minutes left in the show. I'm going to conclude now, and I'll be happy to bring John back on. He's a tremendously good thinker. And uh, if you aren't familiar with his work, I definitely recommend The Cancer Stage of Capitalism. Uh, you kind of have to be familiar with some of the language and terminology that he's he's brought up. Uh, sometimes it might be, seem a little foreign. He's He's got a tremendous uh, intellectual capacity, but uh, very much a big ally in what we talk about. And I'll leave it that for, uh, for now. I hope everyone uh, is doing well out there, and we'll be back next week with uh, more, uh, more work. I think maybe even Federico or Tom might be on, but we'll see how it goes. Take care, everybody.